<laughs> but thank you guys for being here. My name is Dina Stahlheber. I'm the executive director of the Center for the Arts. And we're here in this beautiful building, thanks to the livery, doing a wonderful show called Naturally New England, which has artists from all over New Hampshire and Vermont on this level in the next room and downstairs all through this area. So it's fantastic we're thrilled to be here. Because we get to be here, we love to enjoy this space. So we thought, why not have some amazing singer-songwriters come in this beautiful environment and share their experience, their approach, their process of songwriting and some of their fun stories, and they're gonna perform a piece for us tonight, um, at least one or two, and then we'll also leave it open to Q&A so you can ask and learn a little bit more about this process as well. Um, tonight the art is also available to buy or purchase if you would like up front. We also are able to do program programs like this free for our members and ten for those who are not members because um, of the memberships and because of people like you and your support. So thank you for being here. Thank you for those of you who are members and allow us to do great programs like this that we hope can enrich our community. And uh, we'll get started. So a little bit more on what it will look like tonight is each artist, we're going to start with one. I'm going to try to do a rough timing so that everyone has a chance to be able to share and perform. Uh, each person will have an introduction, share about their piece if they want to before or after, and perform a song. The remaining time we'll have open to questions so we can all learn a little bit more about the process in which they use. I'm excited tonight to have Doug Farrell, Click Horning, Kathy Lowe, and Jennifer White and Jim Spears with us tonight. these if you don't know them I think most of you guys know these amazing individuals but I um, may not know every single one they're phenomenal artists in our area and I think quite stellar songwriters so I'm excited to hear more about their process myself I'll be facilitating some of the conversation and um, we'll be open to questions uh, at some point but let's start with I believe it'll be Doug Farrell let's see oh, is this the point first? oh I'm sorry I will right, start with click warning first so, Cliff, would you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Um, I'm not coming back here, but I will. Hi, folks. Hi, Hi. 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 Old friends, lots of old friends. Um, I um, started writing songs when I was about 15. I couldn't say that I was influenced by Bob Dylan, but I was uh, totally, and uh, the, the music of the day. And, uh, Started off playing simple folk songs and stuff because that's all I could do. And uh, then when I was uh, 17, I went down to New York City. I uh, uh, got a publishing job writing for a publisher down there, a staff writer, and wrote songs for two different companies at uh, different times. And uh, through that, I got um, I got to make a couple of 45s for Lori Records, 45 RPMs, which is the one with the old minute. And then uh, I did a couple of, uh, I did an album for ABC Records with uh, Tom Wilson producing. Uh, and uh, then I uh, eventually just couldn't wait to get back to New Hampshire, which is what I did. And so now um, I play songs for a living. It's a humble living. Have a lot of fun doing it. And the first song I'm going to do for you is called Dennis is Sinking. And uh, is the story. I um, went to uh, Europe with my father and stepmother and my sister Peggy when I was uh, about 19, I guess. Uh, we went to, we were supposed to go skiing in Kitzbühel in uh, Austria. And we got there and it was mud season in Kitzbühel. And uh, skiing was icy and treacherous, and I was a terrible skier anyway. But uh, when I got home, and so the second day, you know, being family, we argued a lot the night before we'd been drink, all been drinking. And so the, the second morning at breakfast, we all met, and my dad says, uh, We've decided that you guys should go your way, and we'll go our way. And so, where do you want to go? So I, I, you know, I said to my sister, I had seen a poster in. Fifth Avenue at a travel bureau of Venice, and it just looked absolutely magnificent. And I said, Let's go to Venice. You know? So 
Uh, she said, that sounds fine. So we, uh, they put us on a train from Austria and uh, that evening we arrived in Venice uh, on a rainy night and bought an umbrella at the train station and walked to the nearest hotel. And anyhow, um, so like I said, it was mud season there as well. And uh, when we got out the next day, the weather was nice and we walked around and we were looking at these buildings where people had like moved up to the next floor because they flooded out. So, um, you know, that really left an impression on me. And uh, it wasn't until I got home to my apartment in New York that I uh, was, uh, the song started coming to me in the middle of the night. And my girlfriend was in bed because she had to get up and go to work the next day. So I, um, I took my little Martin and I went into the bathroom, which was quite a ways away from the bedroom. And I wrote this song in the bathroom. <laughs> so, so there's my story. Venice is singing. And uh, uh, I couldn't wait to wake her up to play it for her. There's nobody to play it for me. I was pretty good at the time. Um, and it's just the song has stuck with me. And you know, I've seen the special about what the billions of dollars they've spent to save Venice, which is an amazing uh, feat of engineering. Uh, they're still not sure if it's going to work, but um, uh, it floods regularly there. And, so the song is, holds true, but it was really more about about um, the impermanency of life and of everything, really. So without saying too much more. <laughs>
mic is still there, but we're going to have a few minutes for questions from Flick. I do have a couple myself, and I am just amazed at the closeness of poetry often and storytelling, especially in this kind of genre that you find that we find many of these artists kind of dabbling in with toes in. Um, how do you approach that? Well, I'm curious, for your process, do you find the words come first? Do you find that you kind of have a rhythm and a lulling to a sound or something that's in your thoughts? How did how did this song kind of come forth? I'm not really sure I remember. Uh, I, I write from many different points of view. Any way you can get your foot in the door, basically, is how I'll write a song. But um, So I, uh, uh, I usually start with the music. Usually, and that's probably what happened was I was probably sitting on the John playing my Martin, <laughs> and the music started coming to me. The, the seat was closed. <laughs> and, uh, um, but with that one, the words may have come first, or sometimes they'll both come at the same time. It's very unusual. That doesn't happen often. And those, I, I know that I got back from that trip, and I wrote four new songs. Uh, just from traveling. So I think that anything you can do to stimulate the, the juices and get them flowing is a good thing. So yeah, I, um, on that one I'm not positive what came first. It, they, it all works together, so I think they might have all come at the same time, to tell you the truth. Well, and for words, do you spend a lot of time tweaking the wording and just trying to get it right, or do you find it kind of flows? Oh, yeah. Sometimes it flows. Uh, a lot of times I labor over things. I won't plan for anybody for months sometimes until I reload. So, well, plus you have to learn the song. I mean, you know, we're writers, but we're also performers. And you can't expect that the minute you write a song, you're going to be able to perform it. So um, a lot of time is spent trying to learn the song and play it right. And, uh, and then there's tweaking that goes on forever. You know, I mean, I, once I get it established, I usually don't change much, but a line will come to me 10 years later, and I'm like, oh, that's a better line. Why, why didn't I think of that? And so I'm not, you know, I'm not so inflexible anymore that I won't you know, throw in a new line if something good comes to me. Soft question, I apologize. Yes. Hi, I, I, I got to thinking part of it through. It's like, he was a young fellow who wrote this, and it seems like something I can identify with now is I'm a little older. Um, and then I started thinking, well, it was a pretty tumultuous time back when you were a young fellow. So I was wondering, what year did you write it, do you know? Um, that was in 1970 or 71, I want to say 70. So uh, I was maybe 22 when so I wrote that. I've been in New York. A lot was going on, that was not a happy thing. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in my first live-in relationship with anybody. Uh, and uh, we were pretty happy. We had a nice apartment on the Upper West Side. And uh, life was good, um, but I've always had a dark side, and you know I've always seen the kind of the sadness in things as well. I, you know I had a pretty sad childhood, and uh, um, I'll explain. I lost my mother technically when I was 11, but I never saw her after age six. She moved to California, and I moved to New Hampshire. You can't get much further away than that. And, um, she died young, and so, you know, I mean, I, I think I've always had a sort of sadness about me, but um, I don't necessarily think of that song as sad. I think of it as pretty and true, and there's a lot of truth there. Um, but yeah, I was a deep thinking young soul, you know, what can I tell you? <laughs> we have a short second, so Rick. I want to start by putting, I do have a question, but I want to put in the plug first. So, Night Kitchen is your band. And you played at our wedding reception. And we, we've been following you for years. And, and, and wonderful, wonderful music. But I, I often hear about the subconscious role in writing in any form of creativity. Do you ever uh, think about something or maybe have some of the words or some of the music and then you wake up in the morning and, and you realize it comes to you within the night? Or? Yeah, I mean, or a, a, a brilliant jazz keyboardist told me once, uh, she was the mother of a, of a friend of mine, she said, click, hang on to everything, you'll, all, you'll find you can use it sometimes. So I mean, if you have scraps of stuff, I'm, I'm sure everybody keeps notebooks and stuff like that. So you know, I've had ideas that I didn't use for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden, it's time to write that song, you know, or, uh, 
looking for something to work on. So yeah, it, it can happen anyway. I mean, I, I started out writing poetry before I was proficient enough on guitar to you know, assume that I could write a song. Um, I wrote a poem in high school about raking leaves, and it was very much fashioned after uh, Robert Frost, who I admired a great deal. And uh, my teacher, and I never, I never got A's. I'm, I was a C minus student kind of. Um, and my teacher gave me an A minus on it. And one of my good friends uh, said, "Click, you deserve an A plus on that." And I said, "Well, I think she was trying to keep me humble, you know." <laughs> she didn't want to, you know, but uh, that was your mom, by the way. <laughs> Just occurred to me. But I, I, I loved her as a teacher, actually, and uh, I, I thought that that wasn't a bad move at all because I was cocky enough as a kid, you know. But it did deserve an A plus. <laughs> she may have seen that the Robert Frost uh, the influence there. Maybe she, uh, anyhow, it's not Thank a bad Thank you, Cliff. Well, we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to move on to the next artist. We'll have an intermission after each uh, artist does uh, sing, perform, and share. We'll have an intermission, and then another round so you will be able to have another chance to ask questions and even at intermission and whatnot. But thank you so much Cliff. We're going to move to Doug. Hi. Hi Cliff. Hey. Um, I'm Doug Farrell. Um, I'm a carpenter. I mean I'm a singer songwriter. <laughs> um, yeah my influence is uh, I was born in 1960 and I had an older brother that was eight years older than me and another brother that was five years older than me. And they really, they were into really good music. And, um, my first 45 was Jimi Hendrix all in the Watchtower. And I, I tell you that so you think I'm cool. <laughs> but if I'm honest, I gotta tell you my second 45 was um, the Banana Splits. Does anybody remember the Banana Splits? Yes. And, uh, I like that one better. <laughs> I would like uh, play, I was writing a lot as a kid uh, in, in high school, before high school. And, uh, poetry, and I, I was writing to it. I liked it a lot. And, uh, I didn't, it went by the wayside for quite a few years. Um, I picked up alcohol for a lot of years. And I quit quite a while ago. But it sort of it cut the tap off for the writing, but the tap came back on somewhere around 2003 and started writing again. You know, I never liked like songwriting contests. I thought they were silly. Like, how could you judge one song against another? Then I did one and I won. And I thought these aren't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I did like maybe three or four more, and I won like three more. And I figured I better quit now. <laughs> but um, I was asked to do this song. I'll talk about this song later. Um, but a lot of it stems from my. I have empathy for inanimate objects. Um, like when I, I'm a carpenter, I've been a carpenter my whole life, and um, I, I hate throwing out old tools. I feel bad for them. Uh, I feel guilty when I'm not following my GPS directions. Uh, I bought a new mechanical pencil. Because I've been using wooden pencils my whole life, and I'm really sad because they're just sitting there. And they're like, what's the deal? Uh, but, I saw this house. I work on old houses. I've been working on old houses most of my life. I have a lot of architects that call me. I got one for you. It's really old. You're gonna love it. And um, but I was driving by this house, and the walls were gone. You could see into the rooms, and it was falling down. But there were curtains on the back windows still. And I thought to myself, well, there's a handyman special right there. <laughs> And that was the, the inspiration for, for this song. And um, thanks for asking me to play it. <laughs> Oh, 
writing a song called You Should Hear Me When Nobody's Listening. <laughs> 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 
but I love to write, and I've always loved to write. And um, you know, I, I have a lot of musician friends, and we go out and we play. You know, and when music stops, a lot of times we're just kind of looking at each other. Less gems there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not out. I'm not. A, my big struggle is overcoming the, you know, that conversation in my head that tells me, oh, that, that guy in the back, he, I can tell he doesn't like what you're doing. <laughs> so it's just overcoming the ego uh, is the goal for me in all of this stuff, really to write a good song. And I, I, Jack, my friend Jack is here, we play in a band called Decatur Creek, that's a shameless plug. And he helps me write sometimes too. Um, but. Yeah, I, I love the writing process, and um, yeah, I'm not I'm not like uh, an actor, but very outgoing. I seem outgoing, but I don't really want to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's so it's so wonderful because I look even at some of these paintings, and these are people's babies, right? And so much of your music you've done is, and then I think imagine all the work. In some cases, maybe there isn't, but it's part of. Us as creating, right? As creating beings, and to put that out there must be really challenging at times. It is, a, it, and there's such a correlation, I think, between you know a, a baby and a song, and you hear it from a lot of songwriters too. Like that, you know, have a new one, and it's a baby, and, and um, you know, clicks that we have to learn the song. But you know, often we want to bring the baby out. We want to show it there. Look how beautiful my baby is. <laughs> And everybody's like, it's pretty ugly still. We <laughs> <laughs> haven't learned it yet. <laughs> yeah, it smells. <laughs> but the seat was down when he wrote it. <laughs> 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 yeah, so <it's>, <laughs> no, but they are, they're like children. And, and you, you like, feel that way about them, you know? It's like there's a collection. And I go, oh, i got to get them all recorded. I'm going to die. I don't have them all recorded. You know, it's crazy thoughts. Well, they're beautiful. I'll have time for one question if there's one in the audience. We'll be pretty short. So we can well, I am loving this. This is wonderful. Who's next? All right. We have Jim Spears and Jennifer White. So I wanted to ask all of you a question. So I know some of you. So how many of you would identify as musicians? How many of you musicians would also identify as songwriters? That's interesting. Who's here? What your process is? So um, we're going to do a song that we wrote in, we think, 2004, for those of you who are keeping track to the key of E. Um, and this one's called Flapjack, Flapjack City. So we're going to play it and we'll tell you a little bit about the process. Now I'm wide awake in this sleepy 
So if I find something like I did with that with that slide link, you know, when I played that, you know, it's sort of like a standard kind of blues lick, but when it sticks with you, basically when I find something that sticks with me, if I can't, if I'm not sick of it in a few minutes or a couple of days, then I think, oh, I'm on to something, I've got something that I can work with here. And then, you know, and then we're off to the races with you know, the rest of the story, the melody, the words, you know, fine-tuning things, and uh, they say it's not really writing, they say it's really rewriting. When you write music, you, you start with an idea, and then you rewrite it, and then you rewrite it some more. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great that we have such a nice, intimate crowd that we can talk about things we do in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> We're just that close. <laughs> I have written songs in the bathroom before uh, because the acoustics are fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of echo in there. Yeah, we sound great. The 
That's why everyone sings in the shower. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you should hear me when nobody's listening. Yeah, you should hear me when nobody's listening. In the bathroom. Who sleeps in the bathroom? Everybody, right? Yeah. In the car, you sound fabulous. In the car, why don't you have a recording contract? You sing yourself. <laughs> so we find, too, that um, you know, if you sit down and write a song and you don't really have a particular idea, well, you could be writing an angry breakup song, you could be writing a, a ballad, a love song, whatever. So for us, it's a process of like winnowing down um, and, and Jimmy, I think, does a lot of that winnowing with the, what we call it, organized fumbling that he does. So he's in the key and, you know, he gets a chord progression maybe. And, and the way he plays, he's often, he can play the rhythm part and he's maybe even picking out a little bit of the melody. And when the melody happens, that's, um, you know, it gives you the meter. So, you know, that my girl in Flapjack City. So we had... Oh, and, and the way we came up with this song is he was playing that over and over again. I was actually in the kitchen making tea. I didn't really know what the song was about. And so I said, how about Flapjack City? And he said, well, what does that mean? I said, I don't really know. <laughs> and, uh, we realize it's everywhere, it's, but you'll never find it on a map, Flapjack City. It's um, one of those songs about being discovered. And you know, I think once you have the title and the melody, Again, it's, they're sort of winnowing down, like we, we had the Flapjack City, we got images of train and being discovered and you know waiting for the phone to ring, all those kinds of things. It's like you, you get sort of a palette of words and notes and you can kind of pick and see if they fit in, you know, where the melody goes and where the chord progression is and all that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting process. And Jimmy tends to do a lot of the music and I tend to do a little bit more of the words, but then there's this always sort of, you know, one of us might have a great idea for him the melody or you might have a great idea for a line and one of the things that we love to say is they can't all be gems so anything goes when we're writing like you can put anything out there and it's like all right we'll I'll sit on that a little bit maybe, maybe it'll stick maybe it won't stick so. I have a large notebook full of those mm -hmm. that some of them become gems and some of them just stay in the book <laughs> Any questions from the group? Oh, yes. I have a question. When you're writing, do you use the carpenter pencil or do you use a computer? How do you remember how do you write a pen? Change the pencil. Pencil and paper. Yep. Okay. With a good eraser. <laughs> yeah, and oftentimes we don't really erase much. You know, we'll write things down and instead of erasing it, we might just move it to the bottom in case, you know, it, maybe it becomes another song. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's. Right. We've got things that we thought were aligned in this song that ended up becoming another song somewhere down the road. Yeah. Right, so write in pen, not pencil. Uh, you can erase <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. You're forced to, uh, to look at it later and see if it fits, and if it doesn't, maybe it fits and doesn't. If they want what they call the artist mind, is what people talk about. And really what I think that is, is when you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep at night, you're thinking of possibilities. You know, you see the sunrise, there's a song, you see, uh, you know, people on the patio, you know, there's just anything can be, uh, anything can really be a song. If it strikes you, you know. Do you notate or do you uh, just do chords and words? Just pretty much do the chords and the words and, yeah. And then just remember. Yep. Though we have written songs and worked on songs and put it away and come back and we pick it up and if we haven't written down the chord, you know, it's like, do you remember this one? But yeah, it's just, sometimes it's just gone. So we tried, we've gotten smarter, maybe a little smarter, where we record it on the phone. So we at least have, even if we only have a little bit of the melody or something like that, so we don't. Dulcimer. 
So I have to thank my husband Peter, whose video tonight actually he gave me the idea for this song. And it's called Thin Places. Uh, ten years ago, I was in Bali in Thailand, and um, he, we were texting back and forth, and he said, I just have to tell you about this amazing concept. It's a, a, a Gaelic, uh, Celtic uh, concept called Thin Places. And I think you're in a thin place right now, right? You're in Bali, Thailand. And a thin place is where uh, the veil is thin between the ethereal, ethereal realms and the earthly plane. Um, so everything is balanced and you feel connected and you just mm -hmm. feel great. And, and that's very different for everybody. Like, where's your thin place? You know, it could be nature, it could be with your loved ones. <laughs> for me, um, I found that airports were a thin place. <laughs> Uh, because uh, people, you know, you witness humanity. People are coming and going, and they're, they're hugging, they're crying, they're, they're glad to see each other, they're saying goodbye. And it's like, whoa, this is like really real life. <laughs> um, so, this is Thin Places. I think I'll ask you to sing my chorus too when I get to it. There are places I go. Sometimes alone, sometimes I go there with you. Where the veil is thin between earth and the heavens, grace invites me in. Into those thin places, thin places. So uh, 
I, I came home and I didn't write the song in Bali and Thailand, but I came home and it was like it was one of those flooding in in one night. I don't think I was on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the stories are great because you never know when the song is going to come. And um, uh, people were talking about, you know, are you a performer or a writer? And I was a performer first. I grew up in a showbiz family, and I had an uncle who was an amazing songwriter, my dad's brother, Uncle Tom, and I just would look at him and say, how do you do that? And he's writing songs, what do you, how do you do that? So I, I kept watching him, so he was my mentor, my idol, and I, like, something was happening, a transference of his process to mine, and he would write in the car on the way to work. So I thought, okay, I'll write in the car. So, <laughs> so I wrote so many songs in the car. And that was prompted by Michael Tom. Um, and I, I have what I call project songs, where somebody says, oh, can you write a song about da 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 so, so, okay, so give me all the information, and then, you know, write it all down, and I try to make sense of it and come up with music. And that's, I feel like I did that, but it's really not me. It's not coming from my soul, my inner process, but I can do that. I, I'm a good project song writer. Um, one thing I did a lot was write for uh, Richard Letterer, the linguist, and he said, Here, here's books about language, write a bunch of songs and we'll tour. Like, okay, so I wrote a bunch of songs about language, about this crazy English that we talk every day. Um, I love that, but I write children's music. Uh, I love to write for developmental ages, like what can a two-year-old really understand, what can an eight-year-old understand, I like doing that. And my Uncle Tom wrote a Christmas carol and I thought, oh my god, Christmas carols are thousands of years old. Who writes Christmas carols? <laughs> Uncle Tom! <laughs> so I started writing Christmas carols. So I have a, a CD of original Christmas carols. Um, so I, I feel like I've worn many different kinds of hats for my writing. And I play dulcimer, I play guitar, I play um, harmonium, and a lot of percussion. And I like to sing a uh, poem, uh, too. So, um, yeah. That's what I do. So, Kathy, how do you choose your instrument with your song? Do you start with a song in your mind and then choose the instrument, or do you go back and forth? Is there some thought in that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really so different. Um, I remember when I first saw a dulcimer, I was in, in France. I'd never seen one before, even though I was American. And um, I thought, oh, that's so, so cool. How do you play that? So I got one, and I'm just sort of playing. And like a couple other guys said too, you just sort of find a riff. You know, I found a riff on a new instrument, my new axe. And um, that happened that way. But you know, writing in the car, I'll um, I'll speak into my, my phone and dictate, or I'll sing a line. You know, while I'm driving, I can do that really safely now. And uh, you know, the melody's <laughs> to me. And I'll, 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 I don't want to forget the melody. I don't want to forget, because as soon as I stop for gas or to pee or something, I'm going to forget what that was. Um, um, yeah, so, so I write uh, in pencil also. I don't write or read music. And I, I've written hundreds of songs like all of us. And I don't know, we just have good ears. You either have a good ear or you don't. And I've written with people who don't have an ear, and they get stuck in the chord. They say, no, you can't do that chord here. You have to do this. Like, no, you can't do that phrasing because the notes won't make sense. In your in your um, your your meter, and uh, I just you know, I, we, I think we throw a lot of that out, right? We just do it as it comes from us, whatever that is, and if it works, if it works. Yeah, Judy. So I understand Uncle Tom didn't write any of his music down. Yeah, he didn't write it down. So yeah. do you have a paper copy that someone can interpret your song? You know what I mean? That um, has chords or. No, no, I don't. Uh, well, I have some things written out that I had somebody notate for me. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Your whole you collection. Do you have something? like the song you just played for us? Yes. Yeah. That. Yeah. Uh, the only place you can find this is on YouTube when I'm singing this for the Tiny Desk con Contest. Okay. Well, so it's, win, it's so. only auditory. You don't have anything um, written down. No, and I don't have this on a CD, but. Um, like Doug, too, it's like you write a song and you want to document it and get it recorded. What if I die tomorrow? <laughs> my grandkids have to hear my song, you know? Yeah. So there's that. Um, yeah, sometimes I wish I could write the music out, 
So I, I would just have that. So so the song could go f further. You know, other people could play it on their instrument. Right. Somebody could do that for if you. If they don't have an ear, you know, to just hear it. Yeah. Do you write down any at all, or is it oh yeah, yeah. Write the lyrics down, you know, all the time. Yeah. Uh, on napkins. Rick, <laughs> <laughs> you have a song probably that I know could be internationally famous. Um, how does how do you get attention paid to? I mean, I think every artist in here has a particular painting or photograph that. that is their best, and, they, and, and if they can get it out for the world to see what you can do on the web now, but um, how hard is it to get a song like that, to get that kind of attention? Do you need an agent, or do you, do you need... I, I guess so, and like Doug, uh, I ventured song contests and never really got very far with that either, but that song, because people encouraged me, you know, that's an amazing song, you got to share that out in the world more, so I really did try, and I got it notated, you know, it's written out, and I tried to get it published, and then I couldn't find the publisher to publish it. So, you know, I, I kind of gave up, you know, at this stage in life. Of, I don't really try anymore to push the music out in the ways I used to. Um, it's fun to just share the more intimate settings like this, and to talk about songwriting. And uh, many of us are in the songwriting group. Um, we're not meeting right now in the summer, but for almost 10 years with Julie Snow. Um, so we get together, we share our songs, and we really listen to each other. We don't jam together. We listen to the songs, and we say, wow, but I don't know what you meant on that line. What, what is that? Same word about that. And I don't know about that chord over there, but this part is amazing. Keep that. So we really help each other. You know, uh, we tear each other apart with love, and, and we, it's, mm -hmm. it's really helped us grow in our songwriting. So I hope to uh, resume the group in the fall. Where do you meet? Where do you meet? At my house. And other people join? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You say no. What? What? <laughs> we're, we're at time. So thank you so much, yeah, Kathy. We're going to take a short intermission. <laughs> so um, if you still have CD players in your car, or you still have them in your closet, uh, we all have CDs back there. Um, and some of us have music on, on the um, platforms and online too. So you can search us and we can put our information back there. And we'll also have it on the Center for the Arts uh, website as well. And then feel free to walk around and look at the art. And there's some snacks and drinks here for everyone. And if you're not bathroom on the mind, there's restrooms <laughs> right down there in the back. And there's one upstairs. Thank you. We'll be back in 50 minutes. <laughs> These artists with us today, so I'm thrilled to be able to be a, a small part in putting this together. Uh, thanks to Kathy and each of these artists for taking the time today to do this. It's a hopefully a special event to you as well. All right, we're going to continue and we'll uh, kind of start that same process as we did before. Uh, if we can get Click up here. Hey, Click. You're up. Get out of And I just have to say it's special to have these gems here in New Hampshire. Thank you guys for being in New Hampshire, for performing in New Hampshire, and letting us enjoy wonderful skills and your talent. Yeah. Alright, so Click Morning will be performing and sharing with us again. Go ahead. I have another story. Yeah. I don't know. A different room. A different room, no, no. Uh, this one is not a, war, a water song, so uh, no water falls in the story. This one's called Mad Dog Song. It's kind of a popular one. We do it with my yeah. man. People like to get up and do some sort of a jig to it. I, I don't have to figure out how to dance to this song. But it's fun. And um, the way the song came about, and this rarely happens, is uh, I was, I had a, a guy who was producing my band back then, which you 
calling ourselves Night Kitchen. Um, we, I'm sorry, we were calling ourselves Moonshine at the time. It was a three-piece folk trio. And uh, uh, the guy's name was Richie Drews, and uh, he stuck with me as a producer for a while. He had a, a, a townhouse in Irving Place, which is a beautiful place, and that was our rehearsal place in this uh, duplex townhouse. And um, so he would call me from time to time. He was His main gig was he, uh, he wrote and produced jingles for uh, companies, made a lot of money doing that. And once in a while, they need some input, and they, uh, he knew I hated to do this, but mm -hmm. it, uh, to me it was selling out. But he asked me to work on a jingle. So I, I worked on a McDonald's jingle for them, a couple of things. And uh, um, I actually got to sing on a, on a Yellow Pages. Uh, commercial I had to sing harmony with another guy and, uh, and that was cool um, so uh, anyhow I had this I had been going to this store um, Matt Umanoff's guitars down in Greenwich Village and they had this guitar uh, 1947 Martin 0021 on uh, consignment they were selling I think they wanted six hundred dollars for it at the time and I was think I told, told the guys about it we were rehearsing up at Richie's, and I said, yeah, there's this great guitar, and I'm thinking of selling my guild, and this and that, and, and uh, anyhow, I, I didn't do any of that, but um, it turned out that uh, one day they called me up and said, Flick, we want you to help us, we do stumped on this commercial, would you come over? So I walked up to his place uh, from the village, and, and uh, I, I went in, they were upstairs in the bedroom, and they were, uh, there were all these vintage guitars around and stuff, and, uh, he used to have some guy that would bring him stuff and they would just play it and if they liked it, they might buy it. And so anyhow, they said, oh, try, try this J200 over here. So I strung them and said, yeah, it's pretty good. I think they did wind up buying that one. And then there was this really fancy Martin uh, 00 that had mother of pearl all around the edges. And, and I played it and it was a dog. It didn't play well at all. It was just flat. You know? so I said, don't buy that one. And then after, you know, a little of this went by, uh, they said, um, check out that guitar over there. So I hadn't even noticed it. They, there was this coffin case. Uh, it's the best way I can describe it. And it was made for the guitar. I didn't realize that at the time. And I, so I opened it up, and there's my 00 21 1947 Martin that I wanted to buy. And uh, so they said, give that one a try. So, you know, but this time I'm kind of annoyed because I'm going to tell me they're going to buy this. Uh, anyway, so I played a couple songs on it, and they said, that's for you. So I guess it was kind of payment for, for helping them out on some stuff, I don't know. Uh, great guitar. And so I named the guitar Mad Dog. Um, Richie's partner uh, was uh, named um, um, Robert, um, oh, no, never mind. Um, his name is uh, Robert Kaplan. His nickname was, was uh, he nicknamed himself Mad Dog, and he was like the Brooks Brothers suit kind of guy. And he came in one day and he made up these little posters of himself with his Brooks Brothers, Brooks Brothers suit and said, Mad Dog for President. You know? and I, mean, I would have voted for Kaplan any day. The guy was just a great guy. And uh, he, was, he was, I think, the instigator behind getting the guitar for me. So, you know, that, that day I, I said, God, I'll never be able to repay you guys. And he said, well, you know, if you ever think about it, I'm writing a song about the Mad Dog, uh, I'd appreciate it. And I said, well, you know, I don't usually work that way, you know, but I'll give it a try. So a couple of weeks later, I had come up with this song, which I'm going to play for you, I promise. Uh, and, and so I, uh, I showed it to Richie. We didn't show it to Mad Dog. And then I rehearsed it with my, this, I had a different band by then. It was Henry J. and the Rollers. It was a, a full five-piece uh, country rock band. And um, rehearsed it with the whole band, and then um, uh, Richie called Mad Dog, and, and Mad Dog came, and, and we, they, he just thought he was catching a rehearsal. And we did a couple songs, and then we did Mad, we had the Mad Dog song. And so he was kind of broken up about it. He actually cried. So anyway, this this song paid for a guitar. <laughs> Talking to all the trees and plants, eating raw sandwich to feed the 
It's Mad Dog. Mad Dog. Mad Dog. Mad Dog, Mad Dog, walking down the street. He's tied out of two, but he's up on the next beat. Got a friendly smile for everyone who needs it. Country's his home. Sitting in the Mad Dog. And if I didn't, I wouldn't stay in it for very long. You know? But um, yeah, it's um, it's great. I, as much as I love and I, I have my introspective side, I really like performing. You know, I, I'm I'm like Doug. I'm a very shy person too. And I had to really, um, you know, I recorded two singles and an album before I really performed much. You know? And I was terrified when my management said, "Oh, we're going to get you into the Hollywood Hollywood Bowl." And I'm, so I started, uh, you know, going to open mics at the bitter end and Steve Paul scene and places like that and trying to get some chops because I just hadn't really done it before. Chops. Yeah, well, that's what we, we musicians call you know, chops. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I, I, um, my latest collaboration, which has lasted like 45 years, about his night kitchen and uh, a great bunch of guys. What a bunch of guys. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, two of them have passed away. Um, Dave, our bass player, was became maybe my best friend. And um, uh, Dana was just a delightful person, our drummer. And uh, Jerry and I have remained friends somehow. And um, I don't know, know Jerry Putnam, but he's an amazing, yes. brilliant musician, guitar player, uh, engineer. 
Um, and uh, somehow we stayed in touch. And then um, his son, Bruce, who grew up really coming, sneaking into our rehearsals at night, and you know, his mom would come in, time to go to bed, oh, uh, no, 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 no. So anyhow, he, he didn't even have to practice our songs. He just knew them. I don't know how he learned them. But, uh, and so he's our bass player now. He's well, phenomenal. Well. And, uh, and then his best friend, Alex, had a brother who took guitar lessons from me. And uh, um, his and his brother, uh, Julian, came to me one day and said, my mom and dad want to give Alex drum lessons. Do you not know anybody who would teach him? He said, uh, yeah, my drummer, Harley Walker, I had another band with my wife called the Recording Band, really original name. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I said, yeah, Harley, I think, would do it. I'll, I'll ask him. So so he, Alex wound up taking lessons from Harley, who was a very neat drummer, played a lot of blues. And then uh, he took lessons from Dana, who was our other drummer. So he was the perfect guy to, to come in as our drummer. And it's just it's a wonderful collaboration. So we're very fortunate. We're still playing music. Okay. My songs like children have been clamoring. Play me, play me, play me. <laughs> um, this song. Back in the uh, early 80s, I was uh, doing some carpentry work on a horse farm. And uh, this old guy, he was about this tall, he was about 75 years old, and he, he said, hey, Jimmy. And I said, are you talking to me? He said, yeah. He said, uh, you looking for some carpentry work? I said, sure. He's like, all right, uh, come to my house tomorrow at 6 in the morning. So he, I showed up at his house, and um, he said, here, drive that truck, Jimmy. He says, I'm done. He's like, all right, Jimmy. <laughs> So I followed him down to Route 22 in Union, New Jersey. If everybody knows 22 in Union, it's like the most dangerous highway in the country. <laughs> and he pulls over in the grass between the eastbound and the, and the westbound lanes. And he said, all right, Jimmy, we're going to put up a building here. And I thought, oh, oh this guy's insane. Like, like, uh, what did I get into? Next thing I know, a couple, three, three old guys show up. And they're really carpenters. And we. And I joined this company, and I started working with these old World War II vets for years. I spent seven or eight years working with these guys. And this one guy was my mentor. I was with him all the time. And um, now he, he would like look over my shoulder if I was trying to drive nails. We didn't have nail guns. He had to use a hammer to drive a nail back then. <laughs> and he would just like go like this, and you know, of course, I'd be totally nervous. And he'd say, "Well, you got it surrounded. You should be able to scare it right in now." <laughs> There was all these carpenterisms. And one day he said to me, he said, all right, Doug, you want to be a carpenter when you grow up? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, that's too bad. You can't have it both ways. <laughs> and I watched him say that same thing to all these young apprentices that came in and out. And uh, that was sort of the inspiration for this song, which is called uh, We'll Grow Young. I'll take a little old trip somewhere back in time. It's a switch I'm going to flip and cross a line. I'm laughing and playing again before I'm done. Find the key to the universe when I grow young. The time I've come to see as a little boy inside of me hides away from a man who has no time to play. And I march on in quiet desperation. That child and I in silent separation. If I come knocking at your door, 
changing things and you know playing them and getting to know them better and feeling them in a different light you know um, so I don't I usually when I'm writing a song I love it I'm like oh my god this is great you know? and then someone will say nah and, and you can know um, it just it doesn't stay sometimes I'll come up with a tune and I'm holding that tune for a couple of weeks. And I think, okay, I've got something here. You know? um, so that was kind of a contradictory answer. <laughs> 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 it's nice. It sounds to me almost in some ways, from what I'm gathering here, songs kind of grow. Right? Yeah. They sort of have that life of their own. We're talking about his children. And as they develop, they, they might shift and change in different ways you may not have thought, which is really lovely. So many people in the writing process for books, too, the editing process. If anyone's ever written a book, you edit the heck out of it. And right. it's still even published, not done. Yeah. And I, I, t I used to have a notepad in my pocket. And I, and I just, all these like things would come to me and I'd write them down. And I had pieces of paper all over the place. Yeah. You know, people were like, hey, I found some of your stuff. It's <laughs> pretty crazy. Because <laughs> 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 lyrics aren't always, you know, they're weird. So um, so thank God for phones. Uh, now I have a phone and, and I'll just like dictate lyrics into my phone and then this file gets full and I print them out and I have this wall at home of all the lyrics on them. And then I, I find the ones that are relative to each other and, um, and I'm constantly writing. 
when I play guitar, I just sit down and I, I mindlessly play. I don't know what I'm playing, but I'm just playing whatever. And things, and I go, oh, that was nice. What was that? You know? And, um, and then I try to marry them to the, to the lyrics that are on the wall. Oh, that's awesome. uh, I think it's great. It's actually what a lot of people in the creating process do. Business um, perspective. Any questions out here? Yep. Somebody will walk up to me and ask me to play a song that I wrote, and I'll say, uh, I would, but I don't know the words. <laughs> and then they go, What do you mean you wrote the song? And I have had such a different little time over many, many, many years remembering the words. And that's been very frustrating and, and limiting in many ways. So I'm curious to hear. Uh, from anybody, uh, what's your trick for remembering words other than being more brilliant than I am? Well, <laughs> you may remember, I just forgot the words. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it with grace. Oh, well, that's the thing. And, and I think in the absence of remembering the words, what's, you know, the second best answer to that question would be to have the words. So you can play the song. Uh, you know, uh, rather than just be frustrated because you don't know them, I would suggest use the words till you know them, till you know the song, so that you can play. It, it's probably better uh, place than the frustration of not having the lyrics on you. <laughs> but somebody else might have it. So it's wrote. It's wrote. What's that? It's just wrote. Do it over and over. Over and over again. Yeah. That's it. You just have to keep doing it over. That first song, but we, we don't play that much. I don't play it much. So I need to practice it. This is one that's a little different than our normal process that we explained before because we had a friend of ours who is a writer and had written a screenplay for a movie and at first he just asked Jimmy to play some slide guitar for the trailer, which we did, and we had played music with him out in Colorado. Um, and then he asked us to write the theme song for the movie, so the idea for the movie was um, what we needed to do for the song was, you know, we got the screenplay and read through it and got a sense of what you know what were all these different themes that we were supposed to, to put into this song and um, so the name of the movie is um, Out of the Wild and um, and there's a cowboy in there who was, a, who was a fancy cowboy and then he ended up at a dude, dude ranch he lost his family spoiler alert sorry lost his family went into a lot of despair, met a horse and a woman that pulled him out of that, fell in love with both of those, not at the same time and not in a weird way. <laughs> um, but anyways, we needed to pull all of that into a song that was going to be in sort of a modern day Western. And so that organic process of winnowing that we would normally do and that could take a really long time, sort of some of that had happened for us. So we needed to find you know, the music and, and those kinds of things. So um, that's what I want to say. Um, not a whole lot, I think you, you said it very well. Um, we ended up, uh, that, that was the, the one song we wrote with the lyrics, and then we ended up uh, with 16 other pieces of instrumental music and ended up doing the whole soundtrack uh, for that movie. So that was, that was pretty exciting for us. And we're in it. You can see uh, my head, a bit of my leg, and then Jimmy's head. So watch the movie and keep an eye out for the beginning. Seven seconds. We're in there for seven we're seconds. We're in the movie. In the out, of the wild. out of the wild. It's called, this, this song is called The Man You See Me. Troubled by the sadness in the mirror on the wall. 
But I'm being alive because I don't recognize Living there at all The skin is worn and withered It's gray above his ears The tracks laid in his cheekbones From the weight of all the tears Can you tell me I'm a good man? Loving me. I might believe it all the time. Don't want to be the man I used to be. I want to be the man you see in me. Didn't expect to find myself lost in all this road. Instead of warm by the fire, I'm out here standing in the cold. I'm drowning in my sorrows, sleeping in my shame. When you pulled me from the darkness and you gave the rain, and you told me I'm.
he happened to get it, he emailed it to me, so he got it on his phone, and he happened to be in his truck, he's a tough kind of cowboy looking guy, you know, so he's in the big truck, and he's in line waiting to get his oil changed, and he's playing the song, he's behind a bunch of other cars, and he gets to the end of the song, just as the guy with the clipboard comes up, and he is bawling his eyes out, big guy in his truck, crying, and the guy gets to the thing like, well, wait, what would you want? <laughs> so, anyways, that was kind of the, the meter for us to <laughs> We knew we'd done the job at hand. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, you know, some of this too. How do you keep with your skills, or do you were you trained at all? Did you have a background in knowing to sing, how to use your voice, or not to overdo it, how to play guitar? Because sometimes I remember these things. You hear something, oh, that's what I want. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so it takes a. So do you have to keep your skills up, or were you always just interested in keeping your guitar, same with your voice and writing, and all those things for you? Brain class. It is like muscles. You need to keep doing it. And especially with the guitar, because... Use the mind. Use yeah. the mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the guitar specifically, uh, you need to keep your fingers in shape, keep calluses, Keep playing the strings, keep pressing them down, um, and, and there's no substitute for that. So, and that's the good news because you get to play. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no way around it. It's, it's, it's work. I mean, it, it can be considered work, but we love it. And Jimmy's been playing guitar since he's 13. He taught himself how to play guitar. He didn't know how to. I mean, my ear uh, figured out how to play on my ear. <laughs> 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 yeah, kind of learned um, about the music theory later in realized all the different things that he was doing. And I grew up in a musical family, but did not consider myself to be a singer at all. And no training at all. You know, our family used to sing around the kitchen. I used to listen to my parents sing harmony at the Baptist church in London. You know, and so I sort of picked up some of those things. But I, when I met him, I was not, I had never performed really out at all. And um, we met at a, he was doing an open mic, suggested I come. I was like, no way. And, um, that's a long story. I'm just curious to know what's your favorite artist now, besides you. What's your favorite artist? <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Uh, well, um, as far as guitar playing goes, I like Tony Emanuel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as guitar playing, singer songwriters, I like uh, Bruce Coburn. Uh, plays a lot of. Who? Bruce Coburn. There's some, some okay. very popular music, but mostly he's a brilliant guitar player and a great song. Yeah. So when you're not getting ahead, you kind of like think about that a little so when you're playing yourself? Or is that... uh, yeah, it does come into play. Like, well, with Tommy Emanuel, I don't because no. nobody can do what he does. No. He's not of this world. No. So um, I don't want to depress myself and put my guitars in the fireplace. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't go there. Right. But I try to think, really, I, I, someone said to me a long time ago, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And that's, you know, that's really what I try to do. All right, thank you guys. I wondered how, how were those royalty checks from that song coming in? Oh, by the teens. <laughs> a wonderful experience, I'm sure. Thank you, Kathy, for closing us out. And thank you all for being here. I'll probably share with you a few short words before we wrap up after Kathy, but thank you again for being here. I didn't mention before, um, I think the first song I ever wrote that sort of went somewhere was um, the WBZ radio jingle contest that my sister Susie 
and I entered, and we won the jingle contest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I remember we were in high school, and um, I I got the idea to write the song while I was in French class. So while I was in French class, I'm writing this jingle. It goes, w B C Dum Dum Good You Will See. The only way to listen to the newest sound, stick around, sit yourself down and listen to WBZ. Dum dum good, you will see. Then we head around and everything. So what you have to do is sing the song on the telephone to enter it. So uh, we sang it on the telephone at, from our house, and um, so we got into the five finalists, and then. Um, so people had to call the telephone and vote for you. So our whole high school was lined up in the hallway with their money for the payphone to call and vote for our jingle, and we won. Okay. That was so fabulous. And we've never been on an airplane before. And wasn't that amazing? Yeah. I was 16, you were 17 or something like that. So uh, this is a song I wrote about peace, and um, to me it was a simple song, it wasn't anything big, but um, people said, boy, that's, that's a really amazing song. I said, really? It's, it's so, so simple. Then I realized a song can be simple and really universal, and something can touch with, with uh, something very simple happening. So this is a, the title song on my um, the Christmas CD. This is a, uh, so I sing this every Christmas, but I sing it now for you. It's about peace. So um, 
and I went on a play viewing trip to London recently, and I picked people's brains, and I saw a lot of musicals and talked to theater people, and they said, well, have you written the I Want song? The I Want song, what's that? So every, every musical has an I Want song. And it's the song that the leading person or somebody significant sings the thing that um, they want to happen, you know, and then the play unfolds into that. So I'm learning about that. So watch for the musical to come out. I don't know when, but, <laughs> but that's uh, part of my next journey, is to write, write a musical. Mm -hmm. um, and use songs of, of uh, other friends, too, not just my own music. Um, and another songwriting thing that I'll say that was, if I died tomorrow, uh, I think what I leave is my water tank music. And um, I hiked through the woods and sang through the overflow valve of my town water tank, which holds a million gallons of water. And so above the water line is this huge reverb space. So the pipe I sang into goes in the water and straight up, so I access that reverb. And so I would hike up there, and I would just get so inspired and write these nature love chants. And, and uh, for me, that's my most favorite project of songwriting ever. And it's called Above Water. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Dina, for I have any questions few, or... a few minutes for questions, and I'm curious because, well, I think you should be have long careers, but um, how do you feel your journey in songwriting has changed over time, if at all? Because you've been in France, you've had that kind of season of the water, uh, you have children's music, you have quite a variety. Do you feel like that has just been part of your life's journey, or has there been parts that... Uh, I don't know, what would, you, what would you say you're at now, and how has that influenced your music? Wow, that's a question, huh? Um, I think Jenny mentioned multiple personalities. <laughs> but because I, I feel like I can focus and write in many genres, um, sometimes I can drive myself crazy, but I, I, I can do that. I can write children's songs. I can write Christmas sacred music. I can write chants for drumming. I can write funny songs. I can write serious songs. So um, as I grow older, I, I'm synthesizing more all those, those abilities of just saying, well, I guess I have built this. You know, I have built something. And I, I don't know where else it's going, but I hope I can do the musical. That's my, my focus. You know? But really synthesizing all the music, all the um, multiple personalities into a big orchestra of self. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite brother-in-law. <laughs> it's more of a, an observation. I think music is the highest form of human achievement. I think it, it's the proof of that is that the fact that everybody in the world loves music. Everybody listens to music. And when I see Click Spans, Night Kitchen playing and people dancing to it, I, I think two things. I think to be able to make music with other people in a group must be the highest form of creativity and to see people respond by they have to get up there they're energized by the music and they have to move to it and and i think with jenny and i forget your name sorry but, uh, jimmy, jimmy um, <laughs> to be married and to collaborate and um to make music together must be must be awesome so yeah. thank you for all you give to society yeah thank you for that yeah Kathy, yeah, I was wondering if you sense some kind of a theme for your musical desire, your desire to do a musical. Do you have a theme? Yes, it's, a, it's kind of like um, the age of Aquarius. And, um, it's about the search for the meaning of life. So it's recognizing the mystery. It'll acknowledge many spiritual paths and religions in the world. Um, there'll be questions and, and people confused and um, you know, dialogue between all ages of people about the search. Uh, I'm really the title can I say that on my yes. video? <laughs> so I, I, I was telling this to, what, to our other sister, Kim, and she said, well, I have the title for you. You have to call it Holy Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's really what I would like to call it. Oh. You know? uh, it's like the, um, the musical You're in Town. You know, it's kind of a <laughs> title, but it's my favorite play. I love that musical. That is a really amazing play. I know a lot of people wouldn't go to it because of the, the title, but holy shit. So if it was written S-H-blank-T, you know, when you see it printed, um, 
Anyway, a work in progress. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here, and I do want to close with a, a group bow and again, photo. Um, and just thank you guys for being here. I think it's so special, and, and thank you to each of the artists here. I hope you felt um, just kind of the awesomeness of the evening. I do want to just mention a couple of different things in case you want to stay in touch, because I'd love to be able to share the information and ways you can stay tuned to each of these artists. If you join the Center for the Arts uh, newsletter, I'll, I'll be putting that out so you can that morning by going to center for the arts nh.org. Um, feel free to um, sign up for the newsletter there um, or just shoot us a note and I can, we can talk later about that as well. Um, but I would love to be able to share more information. This is being videotaped once that's ready. I'd be happy to get that out to each of you. You can share it, um, see it again, and hear some of your favorite songs if you have a few from tonight. Also, as Clint was saying, um, uh, Jerry Putnam's amazing. If you don't know him, he runs Cedar House Sound over in Sutton. Uh, lustrous career in sound production and a talented musician. I was able to interview him uh, a couple months ago. So if you're interested in a member, that's something that we did. You can listen to that. He is a fantastic wealth of knowledge, and it's a really interesting conversation. So let me know. And that's also um, for members, but I might be making that more live. If you are interested, I'll be showing that on our website as well and in our newsletter. And finally, if you want to see Kathy Lowe, she is also going to be at our first Friday event, August 2nd, from 4 to 5, doing some of her kids' music. If you have grandkids, kids, friends with kids, bring them on down. We'll have the Junior Barn interns performing as well as Kathy doing some of her awesome, interactive, fun music. So you get to see her again on August 2nd. And where will that be held? And that will be at Whipple Hall. Thank you, Molly. All right, now I'd love for each of you to stand up and let's give these guys a closing.